BTE. The Brendan Telfer Experience. Brendan, welcome back. You're meant to be in the studio live here, but unfortunately, even at your age and stage, after many marriages, you can't stand up to your wife. No, I've given in, but it's, uh, it does have its advantages as well because she's just walked through the door and the first thing she said, darling, would you like a cup of tea before you have to listen to Martin Dillon for 20 minutes? So she's brought me in a nice cup of tea and a Tim Tam. Oh, Tim so Tam. I, think you it's go. I, think it's, I think it's New Zealand's favourite biscuit. I remember they had a competition a couple of years ago and I think Tim Tams came through. But anyway, so I'm sitting here in the sunshine. Incidentally, that little topic, that, well, not little, but that important topic you've just been talking about, I could contribute to go that um, uh, given my close and important relationship with a, a reasonably well-known football player called Alan Shearer. I remember doing... Uh, he, he made a television documentary um, about this subject um, some years ago, and uh, somehow another a very good producer I was working with managed to track him down. Um, he made it for the BBC, and it was about this very topic, and so they put Shearer through an MRI test and all of these other uh, particular kind of tests to find out whether he had done any damage to his brain, because I remember him telling me in the interview that in training he would do something like uh, who did he play for I think Newcastle was he played for, for he played for a Southampton Blackburn and then Newcastle wrapped his career up yeah, yeah. And, and, and he said he he would do about 100 to 200 hitters at training every session he did wow. because you know he was a he was a striker it was part of part and parcel of his arsenal he had to sorry for but the pun there Martin but yeah, he it. had to um, he he had to be good you know and so uh, he was really frightened. He was. He said, I was fearing for my life because I was going to have all this research uh, boffins pouring over him and it was filmed and fortunately he came through with a clean bill of health. But he had a couple of teenage boys when I talked to him and I, I said to him, um, um, how do you feel about your sons? And he said, well, um, fortunately, he said, they, they are playing uh, in a league somewhere, I guess, in the north of England, wherever he w- w- uh, lives now, and they ban kids from hitting balls until they're about, I don't know, 14 or 15 or something that they can't, you know, while they're still growing physically and maturing, they cannot hit the ball. And I think that's probably something that's it's coming in here. Is it, or is it already in here? Well, yeah, I think in the, in the junior grades, I mean, it's interesting talking to Chris Millicent there. Now, he's got an A badge from UEFA. So, I mean, he's, he's at the top of the tree in terms of coaching. But he said a couple of things. I don't know what you called there, Brendan. But one of the things he said is that if any parent says to him, hey, I don't want my kid hitting the ball. He's quite happy with that. He tries to teach the kids the right way to hit it, which is that bone right above your eyebrows is the bone you're meant to hit it with. But look, I mean, wow. you know, if, if you get it wrong, you know, it's, it is going to hurt your head. He's yeah. more about the technique. But, you, but look, when the Scottish FA have turned around, they say that every form of football, doesn't matter whether you're a pro, doesn't matter whether you're a kid playing, um, the day before and the day after a game, you're not allowed to hit it. And, they, oh, and they're going to try and restrict it in practice yeah. as you know as well. Look, I mean, I, 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 I love the hitting of the football. I, you know, I think it's an integral part of the game. But when all of these players, and there's so many of them, and we're getting it in all of the full contact sports, I think we're only just in the last decade or so starting to understand what it does to your brain when you get whiplash oh, well, and tackles, well, what it, you know. Going back to Shira for a moment, in the course of this documentary, he went around and interviewed some of these uh, terrible, terrible sort of pathetic sort of figures. These were legends, I can't remember their names now, that he played with in, in the eras prior to his who are now just in a vegetative state, yeah. these individuals. Yeah. Um, and uh, they couldn't talk, most of them, and their wives and children were talking about it. And when he said, I, when I saw the destruction that hitting footballs had done to these legends of our game, he said, and I asked him the obvious question, would you like to see hitting banned from football? And he said, well, um, not at the moment, no, because he said, if you took that out of football, you've basically, you've basically destroyed an important component of the game, which I suppose you have. Sure. Yeah. But I mean, the same things were kind of said in rugby about head high tackle. No, you can't take you can't take the high tackle out. You know, it's an important part of stamping yourself physically on your opponents. But uh, rugby hasn't suffered because of these really tough laws around head high tackles. And I, um, it's a diff- you can't compare apples with oranges. And I'm sure if you took heading out of football, it would have uh, probably a, a, a far more deleterious or serious effect on the quality of the game, wouldn't it? Yeah, look, look, it'd have to because. You know, I was saying this earlier, we started the program with this. 
you know, you look at, you know, in every sport, uh, defences always get better. You, I mean, you've seen it in every sport. You see it in netball, Bernard. You see it, you see it in, in mm. rugby. You see it in league. You see it in football now. And and so the game developed. So then, then all of a sudden it became tick attack or It's all about passing and triangles and that whole Barcelona or Spanish way of playing. Sometimes the only way you can actually unlock a defence that decides to sit back, pack a penalty area, you can't physically get through with so many bodies, is whip one up in the air. It causes chaos. That's the best thing about it. That's what corners are good for. It causes chaos. So, it, look, it would completely fundamentally change everything about the game if you had to let the yeah. ball bounce. But at the same time, I'm sitting there looking at it going, man, uh, you know, I mean, the research is the research. They aren't making this up, the scientists or the doctors, no, are they? No, they're not. No, 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 it's not. I mean, uh, it's real and it's, it's, it's a major problem. Uh, and I think all of these sports that are dealing with that, one sort of kind of probably hopeful note is that the sports have to really apply a lot of thought which they've never done in the past about alternative ways to get around um the exclusion of these various things from their sport in rugby or in league or league, league don't seem to be too fast about no, 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 no. tackles. No. as long as your head as long as the head still as long as it stays the on the shoulders um, that's it yeah, yeah, yeah. we saw it at the rugby I, league I, world cup brendan I, wasn't it i mean the yeah, stuff that you get yeah. a yellow or red for red for in rugby oh yeah, no you might get put yeah. on report in league it's no. amazing no, I, I think that I think it's somewhere in the laws is that as long as the head has still got some attachment to the neck after the tackle, let's, I won't report. I won't put you on report. Let's talk about the Football World Cup, though. England, England, every time England, yeah. I always just go back to you, me, and Miles working together, and, yeah, and what you would be saying to him today when England qualified. Uh, it's coming home. Dick That's boy. it. It's coming home. Is it though? Um, I, I do, I do like those English footballers. Maybe not as much uh, supporters, not as much as maybe the uh, Barmy Army. They're not quite as, as smart, as clever those guys. But I noticed they were singing, um, "You're going home tomorrow, son. You're going home tomorrow, <laughs> son." <laughs> towards the end of the match, yeah, chanting yeah. the song to the uh, Welsh supporters. But um, uh, yeah, no, it's. it's I, I, I'm, I, I really do love this World Cup. In fact, I think I said to you this morning in the text that I enjoy it, I think, at this stage more so than I do the Rugby World Cup because, you know, these tedious 100-point, 90-point, 80-point victories you get in rugby and you get the apologists coming up, oh, well, it's the only way these minnows can ever improve is by playing sides a lot better than them, which is just nonsense. It does more harm, I think, to rugby in Portugal or Namibia or somewhere if they get beaten by 100 points. Um, remember the Blacks beat France by 145 to 10, you know, 20 Japan. years ago. Japan it was, yeah, 145. Yeah, 17, yeah. 95, mate. Yeah. And what, what has that done for rugby in Japan? Nothing, uh, really. has probably put the game back until they got some decent coaches there. Uh, and and so, you know, I just... Uh, well, it's the yeah, one true it's... game, and I suppose basketball's the same when they play the World Championships. It's the one true sport where you can pick 30 teams and you are going to get even games. We've had a yeah. 7-0 where Spain beat Costa Rica, but Costa Rica turned around and won the next game, could still qualify. We've had a 6-2 yeah. yeah. where England put six bar- past the run. But we've had genuine upsets where, where supposedly Minnow sides have have actually upset them. Yeah, yeah. You don't, yeah, I mean, you don't get that so much in rugby and, and pool play, but, and they've got 32 teams here in football as well, so you'd think, I suppose, it's proof that it is the, the world's most popular sport, that even with 32 teams, you get amazing quality in these pool matches. I mean, uh, I enjoy, I've enjoyed watching England. The other thing about this Football World Cup, which, I, again, I'm just dreaming here, I think it was in the England-USA um, game, uh, I was struck by the fact that I hadn't heard the whistle for a long time. There you go. And I was thinking, wouldn't rugby be a beautiful game if the whistle in the rugby test only sounded as often as it does in a football international? Well, the <laughs> thing with football, it's such a simple game, Brendan. I mean, you can, yeah, you, you can either commit a foul yeah. or you can get offside. But apart from that, there's, you know, the ball goes out, you just throw it in. It's, you don't that hear is. that shrillness of the whistle. Look, uh, rugby's getting like netball at the moment where there are so many penalties yeah. and so many stoppages. And half oh, the confusion okay. around it, mate, is that you know, we don't know. And, and and World Rugby have this obsession where every corner of the globe's got to be represented by, you know, the equality thing. Said there's got to be a Moroccan referee, there's got to be a Kazakhstan referee, there's got to be a Georgian referee. And and you're getting people that are out of their depth. We saw it with Wayne Barnes in 07. He's become a good ref. But if, you go, if you've got world-class teams, the best teams in the world, you need the best referees, don't you? You need the best umpires, mate. Yeah, just let them go. I just love to see a game of rugby where the, the whistle, the amount of whistle, was reduced by fifty percent or something. See, I don't think it would be anything like the disaster that so many 
picking. That, oh, rugby's a technical game, you know, it requires a lot of thought, you've got to have all of these rules and subsets of rules. No, uh, just let it go. I mean, it's... So now, they've well, made it more complicated. Difficult. They've made it way more complicated. And look, yeah. and, and the Women's yeah. World Cup proved to us that if it's actually played in that spirit, well, it's a really exciting game to watch. But, you know, we, we, I've been talked about this for the last week or so, and we talked about it with Steve Hansen, not to name drop, but also Wayne Smith. Where, where's the fun in rugby? You watch a rugby test, Brendan. When's the last time you sat down and watched a rugby test and thought, God, that was fun? Tell me, with, tell me when it was. Uh, well, no, I can't off the top of my head. I, know, I, I enjoy test rugby, and, and I suppose we've become just sort of um, inured to the idea that it's going to be a lot of whistle until we kind of just accept it now and hope we get a couple of tries in the course of the match that are worth watching. But um, this football World Cup, I, I mean, I love watching Brazil. I just think they're just artists to work, those guys. Um, England, yeah, I, I, I sort of always, for reasons I'm never quite sure, have supported them. And maybe it was something to do with the fact that I can still remember that night 1966 World Cup final, um, and uh, you know England won in extra time, and there was a goal. I'm trying to think who the guy was. Jeff, it, Jeff uh, Hurst. Did it come off the bar? The Russian linesman, yeah, the tinner the caviar, yeah, all of that. All that sort of stuff. Well, where did VAR and, uh, and TMO all over that boring and stupid these days? I mean, it's a legend of football that still exists to this day. That's what I love about. Mm. It. I mean. You know, human error happens on the field. Let it happen with the referees as well. But also, I mean, you're a dirty Leeds fan, mate, so of course you like a bit of England. Uh, yeah, but anyway, so, but now it's, we've reached the stage where I've already braced myself. For England are into the playoffs, so it's only a matter of time before they make their penalty shootout exit. And, yes. Um, it could, could be this week, could be next week. Yep. Um, but it's bound to happen. That's why I was really delighted. I think you can correct me if I'm wrong here. But brilliant free kick today taken by Rashford that which put the England up 1-0. He was one of the guys that really copped it, wasn't it, after yep. the penalty shootout yep. against Italy where he missed a, he missed his penalty. Brendan, shoot. he was brought uh, on with a minute to go of extra time. He hadn't even kicked the ball on the sideline. The first kick he made was that penalty shootout. And that's how stupid Southgate yeah. was at that time. And, you know. And so to see him score two goals today, I thought, well, this is kind of, you know, reparation of the highest order. And yeah. uh, so, um, uh, so I like England. Um, I like Brazil. Um, and the other thing here I'm just, uh, it bothers me, uh, bothers me a bit about the World Cup is these messy stories, which are starting to come thick and fast. And I read another one yesterday or today that Messi can never be compared or never put into the same sort of elite sort of category as Pele unless he wins a World Cup. Well, he can't win a World Cup. I mean, he could be he could win the Golden Boot Award at this World Cup and Argentina still wouldn't win the World Cup. Why should that determine his position in the Hall of Fame as term, in terms of the great football players of all time? OK, well, I mean, um, I'll ask you the same question. Johan Cruyff, I mean, one of the greatest players ever, he didn't win a World Cup. Does yeah. that mean he's not? George Best never played at a World Cup. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then, but, but for some reason, there is this sort of yardstick that they play at a lot of credits apply to Messi. And I, I think... Uh, it's because Andy of the Maradona thing. Hello. It's because of the Maradona yeah. thing. Because in 1986, and I've watched World Cups since 74, um, since 1986, and in 1986, he did single-handedly win the tournament. And, and you know, and, and, and yes, it's well, Argentina. Yeah, literally, though. Literally. Yeah, well, yeah, and you're literally and figuratively here, <laughs> exactly right. But yeah. he scored, but, yeah. you know, it was his contribution. I, I've never seen a World uh, Cup tournament where one player has made that much of a difference. I think yeah. I think maybe Cruyff in 74, but they didn't go on to win it. Gerd Muller won that tournament. But Maradona, and Messi's always going to be lumped into that same thing. Is he Maradona? No, he didn't win a World Cup. I totally agree. No. It's not fair. Hey, I want to talk about this live golf thing. I'm going to play you a little quote here. This is from Tiger. Now, when Tiger talks, the golf world listens. Have a go. There's an opportunity out there if if both organizations put a stay on their litigation, but that's the problem. they got to put a stay on it. And whether or not they do that or not, um, you, there's no willingness to negotiate if you have a litigation against you. So um, if they both have a stay and then have a break and then they can meet and figure something out, then maybe there is something to be had. Um, but I think Greg has to go, f first of all, and, and then obviously the litigation against us and then our countersuit against them. Um, those would then have to be at a stay as well. So then, then we can talk. We can all talk freely. A couple of things here. He, it's all, he's talking in a way that he's actually representing the PGA Tour. Is that official now? Is he their spokesperson, is he? No, 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 no. Same with Rory, Rory McIlroy, who's doing a lot of talking. But these two guys, because of their positions in, in golf, um, uh, always being asked every time they have a press conference and after every round of golf, there's more questions about live golf than how many birdies or, you know, bogeys you had on your round. And so they've become the sort of kind of unofficial sort of spokespersons for it. And he's mouthing virtually the same things that Rory McIlroy said last week that 
Norman's got to go and he should be replaced but Norman should be replaced by an adult at the table yeah. at the negotiating table. <laughs> oh, no, how about the that? Negotiating table. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, poor old Greg, um, I'm sure we shouldn't have much sympathy for him because he probably got a hundred million bucks to sign right. on to mm-hmm. r- round up these golfers. But he's toast. He's a dead marine by the sound of it. Uh, if the rest of the golfing world don't want a bar of them, this thing will just continue on. There is this court case that he made reference to where, and I think I mentioned it before, where live golf is suing the major tours because what's happened and what's transpired here is that uh, the live golfers are desperate to get into the major championships and they can't get into the major championships unless they can get their tournaments awarded ranking world points. ranking yeah. points yeah. and so they're all slipping down and quite a few of those 48 golfers in fact the majority of them I suppose well, certainly a few of them are inside the top 50, and it's the cutoff in golf. If you're not inside the top 50, you can't, it's almost impossible to get into a major championship unless you've won them before. And so someone like Ryan Fox is a shoe in now because he's about 23 or something in the world. But these guys are earning hundreds of millions of dollars playing basically just exhibition golf. It means nothing. And Tiger has gone on to say today that he said this, he can understand their frustration because uh, they can't compare themselves, these uh, no, golfers, no. with the legends of the game anymore because they're not playing against the best. So what does it tell you, Brendan? Any... Does it tell you that, and this is, uh, this is courtesy of people of JK's World of Golf 24-7 at the airport, does it tell you that even the biggest pile of cash when it comes down to it as an athlete, at the yeah. end of your career, what do you want? I mean, a 50 million, 100 million, or do you want three of those major trophies up on the mantelpiece because that is actually your legacy? Yeah. I'm so pleased that... Well, you want that the you, money. Yeah. Yeah, of course you want the money, but yeah. that's that's what you die with, though, isn't it? You die with those memories. I mean, yeah. your bank balance yeah. doesn't go with you, but that does, doesn't it? I mean, exactly. I mean, I looked at Cam Smith last week. Uh, now, he won the Australian PGA, but I've gone right off Cam Smith. I've always had a lot of time for him. He's a hard-working Aussie lad. But he was earning tens of millions of dollars. He was the well, number two golfer in the world. And so, goodness only knows how, how much money in the course of the year he was earning between his winnings and his sponsorship deals. But then he turned it all down for a $100 million deal to go and play live golf. Well, why, why, did, why does Cam Smith need $100 million on top of the tens of millions of dollars he's already earning. And he's only in his late 20s. But um, he's gone for the money. Now these guys are saying, well, what the hell? You know, what's all this about? We're just playing these meaningless tournaments every week. They yeah. don't mean anything. We can't get into major championships. So they've gone to court to try and force the hand. And in turn, golf tours, the PGA Tour of America and the DB World Tour, are countersuing these guys. Yeah, it does. So Where does it, it, all, it all comes yeah. to a head in late January when in a court, I think it's in somewhere in California, San Francisco, a judge is going to listen to these arguments and rule on whether the live golf tournaments should be getting um, world champion, uh, world ranking points. And if they do, it's a major victory for the golf. Well, it changes it all. Yeah, it changes and, it all completely. And, uh, and then the board is really much right back in the court of people like Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy. What do you guys do then? If these guys are going to be allowed to play in the major championships alongside you, what do you do? If you're going to be, I think, if you're going to be absolutely true to your principles, you'll say, right, we won't play. No, no, no. I think what they do is they join the tour, mate, because, I mean, everyone wants to play at, what, 30 30 or 18 holes less, don't they? I mean, 54 holes, razzmatazz, music, shorts on the court, dancing girls. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, I no, know no, you no. hate it. No. I know you hate it. Let's finish on Lydia Ko, mate. So at 15 years yeah. old, the number one ranking in the world, she's had her ups and downs and things. Obviously, Foley made a huge difference to her, and whether it was restoring confidence or, 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 or redoing a swing or whatever it is. But to recapture that number one ranking in the world, how significant is it for a start, and how difficult is it to achieve when you've done it seven or eight years ago to do it again? Well, it is very tough, um, and this is more significant, I think, than when she did it first time. No disrespect to what Lydia did in her earlier days, but there was nowhere near the depth in women's golf as there is now. I mean, this is why it's been so tough for Lydia. It's so, it's so much more competitive, and she fell down to number 55 in the world a couple of years ago from uh, right at the top, and even when she'd had a bad year or so, she was still hanging around the sort of the top 10. Then she, her game completely fell apart. She was missing a lot of cuts, and because it was so competitive and so many good golfers coming through from countries that she didn't have to worry about when she first got to the top. But now there's golfers from the Philippines, from Thailand, who are winning major championships and Japan. Although Japan's always had a, a strong history of golf, not so much in women's, but in recent years it's come through. And so it's so much tougher to succeed now. 
And you know, it's been a fantastic year for her. And sure, she's won $3 million. She's won three times. She's back at number one. But there still is, for me, just a sense of unfinished business and possibly a little bit of sadness as well. She hasn't won a major championship since 2016. So since then, it's been, what, four, six years they play five major championships a year in women's golf, so she's played 30 major championships uh, the last 30 and hasn't won any of them. And I have no doubt that number one above everything else next year will be for her to get back into the winner's circle on a major championship because she's only won two, and it seems a bit of an anomaly, really, when you think of what else she's done. Um, and it's great that she's number one, that she fully deserves it, um, but... Uh, unfinished business still there for a Did she bit, retire as she back. does, mate? Because, I mean, I, was, I heard um, Beth Allen Page, I think, was saying that she reckons she's going to retire in a couple of years or something. Yeah, she did. She Well, she said that when she was very young. She said that when she was a teenager. Yeah, she was right. turned mm. pro. She said, I want to be finished when I'm 30 and I guess have a family and, 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 and those sorts of things. Um, and she may well do. I mean, she's getting married to a guy who's. Uh, well, he's got a fair bob, hasn't he? He's got a fair bit. I think well, he, he owns he's, half of South Korea, doesn't he? Is from the Hyundai family. Yeah, yeah. okay. There you go. So, so it doesn't do too um, bad, does it? It should be should be a reasonable sort of feast they put they put on <laughs> for their family and friends on the thirtieth of December or whenever it is. Yeah, exactly. Um, so she won't be needing any extra dough, I imagine, no. after she turns 30. I hope she does, but, mate. I um, hope she walks away if, if that's the case. I mean, you know, we're well, just... Well, I think if she wins... I think if she wins a couple of majors between over the next three or four years, I think 30 will probably do her. OK. Um, but uh, she'll probably hang on, I think, and uh, next year will be the year she's got a strike. She's at the top of her game again now. She's overcome all of these obstacles and hurdles and the depth in the fields, and she's number one. That has to translate to major championship victories. Next year has to be her year. Okay, all right. You better go and check the car, mate, because you know what happens whenever you lend her the car. You just have a quick walk around. Just I know you do. You just check, just check what the wheels. There's no kick, kick, the, kick the tires. <laughs> no, 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 the engine. No, no, the, the, the what is it? The, the cooling device went mad, and apparently the the oh. temperature of the engine was over oh. 100 degrees. Oh, God. She oh. had a mild panic. But oh, okay. Anyway. Well, no, 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 you need to sort that. That's probably a water problem or an engine coolant, Brendan. You've got to do something about that. I'll get on to that. Thanks, buddy. Oh, the two minutes. Drill. As Brendan Telford, the Brendan Telford Experience every Wednesday, ladies and gentlemen. He'll be in the studio next Wednesday.